Welcome back to 2004. Close your eyes and imagine. You take a break from playing Pokemon Coliseum so you can train for the big date, August 20th. The day comes and you travel down to the Wyndham Palace Resort in Orlando, Florida. Your heart is pounding and your deck is in your arguably way too sweaty of hands. It's time and you are ready. You are finally going to compete in the first official Pokemon World Championship. And chances are, you won't make it that far. This is because you probably aren't Chris Folip or Sugiyoshi Yamato, who are the two Masters Division finalists that we're going to talk about. Let's talk about them and the lead up to this first official Pokemon World Championship. Before we get there, however, I just found the button to see YouTube analytics and saw where only 1.5% of you who watch my videos are subscribed. You've heard the spiel before, so you know what I'm going to ask you to do. Thank you, and let's move on. With its first American set released in 1999, the Pokemon card game shot off in popularity just as intensely as the games and the anime before it. These cards were distributed by Wizards of the Coast of Magic the Gathering fame, who followed in the footsteps of Media Factory, who had been in the Japanese Pokemon card game scene since 1996. Along with translating the cards and providing them to eager children across the country, Wizards of the Coast was also responsible for running the competitive scene in America. Between 1999 and 2002, things were going swimmingly, and no one could foresee what was coming in late 2003. There were some minor disagreements over the years, but after Hasbro's acquisition of Wizards of the Coast, the Pokemon company hired several of Wizards' employees and began to produce the card game themselves, prior to their end of their current contract with Wizards. On October 1st, 2003, one day after the end of their agreement, Wizards sued Nintendo over an accusation of them stealing trade secrets and making cards while it was still Wizards of the Coast's job to do so. Hearing that many people's favorite era of cards ended on such a sour note sucks, but at least the two companies were able to settle out of court later that year, and as far as I know, there's no bad blood anymore. With Pokemon now in charge, they had full control over the printing of their cards and the competitive scene that was based around them. This led to the creation of Pokemon Organized Play, which was Pokemon's way of, you know, organizing play. With any cohesive league, all tournaments led to a world tournament, the Olympics for children who played the Pokemon card game. Well, not only children. For the sake of not having 25-year-old men dunking on 9-year-olds, they added age divisions. These were the Junior Division, 10 and below, Seniors at 11 to 14, and Masters, which were 15 and up. For this specific episode, I plan on covering the Masters Division finalists, but I also plan to jump around divisions moving forward, depending on what decks were printed and what decks are most interesting. One particularly cool fact about the bracket for all divisions is that grand finals were always between one American and one Japanese competitor. The chances of this happening were actually pretty high though, because in all of the 48 World Championship participants, only 6 weren't from either Japan or the US, and the number of foreign competitors per division only decreased as age increased. The Japanese-American matchup we're going to focus on today though, as stated in the start, is Sugiyoshi Yamato and Chris Folip, with their decks Magma Spirit and Blaziken Tech. Without further ado, let's talk about these decks, how they work, and how they compare. From this point on, everything I say will be under the assumption you know the mechanics of the Pokemon trading card game. If you don't, I will leave a super cool video in the description and you can come back here after. Now if you're coming back from that video, or if you didn't need to watch it, it's time for us to dive into Chris Folip's Blaziken Tech deck. In the trading card game, there are different deck archetypes, which are just basic deck structures that are common during different times in different places. Almost every deck popular in the high-ranked competitive scene is a variation on the current meta. Folip was no different with his deck Blaziken Tech being a variation on the past its prime Rambo archetype. So what is a Rambo deck, and what did Chris Folip do to breathe new life in this dying breed? Rambo is short for Aquaza EX, Team Aqua's Manectric, Blaziken, and the end goal of the deck, which was one-hit KOs. Folip used a variation that involved less Rayquaza and more focus on Blaziken EX as the attacker, 
making it more of a Bambo deck. Being afraid to use the name Bambo, the Pokemon company landed on the name Blaziken Tech, and that's the name we'll also be using. If you are interested to know Rayquaza's function, assume everything I say for Blaziken EX will also apply to it. Speaking of what I say about Blaziken EX, how about I start this deck discussion with saying something about Blaziken EX. This is the Goku of Folop's deck. He is the muscle, and even though his friends are strong, they are only stalling for the wrath that Blaziken EX can unleash. That wrath in this situation is the attack Volcanic Ash, and like every game winner in Dragon Ball Z, it also takes 10 episodes to charge up. Using 4 energies, Blaziken EX can do 100 damage to any opponent Pokemon, whether they are active or benched. Not only does it have a long initial charging time, but you have to discard 2 fire energies after attacking, making it so you need to charge back up to use it again. Unlike anime though, there is no plot armor here, so Blaziken EX needs to rely on a lot of other Pokemon for it to work at full capacity. Technically being the deck's namesake is a lot of pressure, but rest assured that Blaziken earns it. While not a heavy attacker like their EX counterpart, Blaziken is built for keeping energy in circulation using its fire starter ability. The ability states that once per turn, you may take a fire energy from your discard pile and put it on one of your benched Pokemon. This helps make it so that even though Blaziken EX is always losing energy, they can always make it back in some capacity. This Blaziken also has an attack, but it does less damage and still has to remove energy, so bringing energy back to the bench is its largest contribution. Once the energies are in the bench, how do they make it back to Blaziken EX? That question, my friends, is my frictionless transition to talk about the next Pokemon, Team Aqua's Manectric. If Blaziken EX is Goku, the Manectric is the citizens of the universe, because it provides Blaziken EX its energy. Are these Dragon Ball references getting too much? I can shelf them for now, but no promises for later. Anyways, while it can do decent damage with Thunder Spark, Manectric's main attraction is its ability Power Shift. Blaziken can use Firestarter to put energy on Manectric on the bench, and Power Shift can send that energy directly back to Blaziken EX. Despite being the final piece in Folip's Rube Goldberg machine, there's only one in the deck, so there's a large need for consistency cards to get out Manectric along with other cards as fast as possible. One of the most unsung heroes of this deck is Dunsparce, whose hit and run attack allows the player to get some basic Pokemon, specifically three of them, on the bench very fast. Which is good, because all of the important Pokemon in this deck are evolutions. One of these evolved Pokemon is another consistency card, Delcaddy. Using Delcaddy's energy draw, the player can draw three cards in exchange for putting an energy in the discard pile. If you've been paying attention though, and you should be, there will be a quiz later, we know this isn't a problem because of Blaziken's fire starter. Delcaddy is made even stronger by the supporter card Oracle, which allows you to choose what two of those three drawn cards will be. These are among many less notable consistency cards, like the usual ones that let you evolve your Pokemon or draw more cards. Lastly, and Folip's largest deviation from the conventional Rambo deck, is his Swiss Army Pokemon, Bilossum. It earns this title by serving as a counter to multiple other popular decks in the current meta. It was able to counter the American Whalerin Miloptic archetype by using its Heal Dance ability to consistently heal against chip damage. This Heal Dance also helped counter the Japanese Magma archetype, which uses the Desert Ruin Stadium to personally assault Blaziken EX. This card's purpose of countering Team Magma decks will become ironic later, but first we need to talk about Folip's competitor, Sugiyoshi Yamato, in his deck, Magma Spirit. In the 2004 meta, many Japanese competitors were using the Team Magma archetype. Obviously, nobody ran this deck better than Sugiyoshi Yamato. 
You can get an idea of the falling behind this deck, knowing that in this tournament alone, it made multiple top 4 finishes even in other age division. Its popularity was just short of having stan accounts made for it. One thing that made it so popular was the built-in synergy between the Team Magma cards, making it so the deck building was less about which cards had any synergy, but more about which ones had better synergy within the given group of cards. Based on the results of the tournament, it's obvious that players found out what those cards were, and now it's our turn to follow in suit and see what cards were used in Yamato's impressive deck, starting with Team Magma's Groudon. Yamato's shining star, Team Magma's Groudon, is responsible for most of the damage done in the Magma Spirit deck. This damage is caused by the move Pulverize. Pulverize only has a small base damage of 50, but that is increased to 70 given the opponent is already damaged. Laying that damage on is easy for Groudon using its other move, Linear Attack, which allows it to deal 20 damage to any Pokemon on the enemy's side. All this, and Groudon doesn't have to discard half its energy when it uses an attack. What could the downside be? Well, in accordance with its ability Power Saver, Groudon cannot attack without at least three Team Magma Pokemon in play. Of course though, there is a solution both in Consistency Trainer cards and another special Pokemon. Team Magma Zongoose was one of my favorite cards when I was little because the art was cool and it reminded me of my favorite game, Pokemon XD. Also, because at 2 years old, I knew that it was one of the most versatile support cards in Yamato's deck. It can use the move Call for Family to get any other basic Pokemon in the deck onto the bench. Having this move alone isn't special, it's technically worse than Fullip's Dunsparce who could get 3 in one turn. Where Zongoose is unique is its ability to do up to 60 damage per turn with a low energy cost. The move Team Play does 10 damage times however many Team Magma Pokemon are in play. This means Zongoose will probably be able to do hefty damage before Groudon, or even before the opponent's MVP is set up. As I reach the end of this Pokemon's description, I realize I am running out of 5th grade level transition sentences, so I'm just going to skip on to the next two. Team Magma's Camerupt and Team Magma's Claydol fill in the slot for energy transferring. Camerupt's overheat ability allows it to take the energy from the discard pile at the cost of 20 health, and Claydol has the ability Magma Switch, which allows it to move energy from any Team Magma Pokemon to any other. This is like Folip's strategy, but with its own unique set of pros and cons. The main difference is Yamato's deck does not need to entirely rely on this strategy to succeed. In addition to their abilities, Camerupt and Claydol can do decent damage, 50 and up to 60 respectively. Now that we've addressed all the damage dealing cards, what's up with the notable trainers? Actually that was a lie. There is a damage dealing trainer card, Desert Ruins, but we've already addressed that its chip damage is hypothetically cancelled by Blossom, so we're going to move straight into the Team Magma cards. Like I said in the beginning, there's a lot of pre-built synergy between cards, and that is exemplified by these trainers. Cards like Team Magma Ball and Team Magma Conspirator exist for the sole purpose of getting Team Magma Pokemon on the field quicker. In addition to trainers, there is even special Magma Energy, which provides two fighting or dark energies, but only for one turn at a time. That's it for Team Magma specific cards, but geez, if you had taken a shot every time I said Team Magma, I wouldn't even need to apologize, because you'd have been long gone by now. Luckily, we can move on to the normal trainers, with the purpose of things such as drawing cards or switching out. The coolest non-Magma trainer card is Pokemon Reversal, which after a coin flip, can bring a Pokemon from the opponent's bench forward. This works wonderfully with Groudon's ability to hurt Pokemon on the bench and then deal extra pulverized damage. Was this immense pulverizing pressure enough to stop Folip's Blaziken's? Yes, but why is that? No matter how hard I looked, there was no official recording, so I can't say what happened definitively. When we get to the point where I can actually see the match, I'll analyze what actually happened. As of now, all I'm about to say is speculation as to what could have been what led to the results on that fateful 2004 afternoon. 
The biggest fear I would have if I was Fulwip would be the low quantity of certain important cards in my deck. Blaziken and Tech relied heavily on both Team Aqua's Manectric and Blossom, both of which there were only one of in the deck. There isn't even a Gloom, meaning that Blossom needs special assistance if it even wants to evolve. This isn't a problem when they're in the deck because of all the supporter cards, but even the support card that lets you get them back from the discard pile, there's only one of. They're even more in the hole when they end up as prize cards. Not only is it harder to get prize cards without these important Pokemon, but when you do, there's only a 1 in 6 chance of getting what you need. When you have the pressure of the Pokemon World Championship on your shoulders, that chance feels more like 1 in 7,368,206. That's more of an isolated issue though. When comparing the two decks, the most blaring thing is that Magma Spirit's optimal setup time is significantly shorter than that of Blaziken Tech. Yamato also had the comfort of not using EX Pokemon, which would give the opponent more prize cards when defeated. Lastly, and probably funniest, is that every Pokemon in Fulop's deck was weak to at least one of Yamato's. Super effective moves are scary in the video game, but in the card game, it's a lot harder to have Pokemon with type coverage. Double damage is nothing to scoff at especially at a time where the average HP was lower. If Claydol was only going to do 60 damage, it will now do 60 more damage. So, while not an instant death sentence, I'd be lying if I said it was a good thing. I'd also like to clarify, whether for my sake or yours, that even though I almost exclusively spent this section talking negatively of Fulop's deck, it's only because at this high level of play I have to nitpick. Obviously, it's a great deck, and no matter my academic achievement, I never could have built it. It having made it that far in the championship shows its quality, but at the end of the day, it did fall short compared to Yamato, and there has to be a reason why. If I got this reason wrong, feel free to share with me what is right in the comments, but don't be mean about it because that would make me pretty sad. With Yamato taking victory over Fulop, he received $7,500 and a no-strings-attached invite to next year's tournament, among other things. Speaking of next year's tournament, I'm hoping for this video to be the start of a series, where I will have the opportunity to talk about every year's meta, some of the decks in the World Championship, and a little bit of history about where Pokemon was at at the time. In addition to just talking, I intend to collect the main card from every deck that I discuss. For this year, I chose Team Magma's Groudon and Blaziken EX, the two stars of this show. Here I am putting my adoptees into their new home. That's all there is to this World Championship Grand Finals. Hopefully you learned something because I know I sure did. Let's together learn from these decks and maybe one of us can be competing in the next modern day World Championship. Until that day comes along, like, comment, and subscribe. It is free, so you will always get your money's worth.